Hello and welcome to episode six of Headstrong Creatives in Conversation. I'm Louis Strong and I'm the host of this podcast. This podcast, Headstrong, is all about uh, talking to people in the public eye and talking to them about their experiences throughout their life, from their upbringing, their careers, their relationships and their journey. But fundamentally, I want to know about their vulnerabilities and how those vulnerabilities have shaped who they are today to get them to be in a place to be headstrong. And I want to inspire you, the listener, to understand what being headstrong means. On today's episode, and I apologize for the delay in its release, is Jonah Howard King. Jonah is a fantastic actor and individual who has just been cast as Prince Eric in Disney's remake of The Little Mermaid. I had recorded this episode previously in August and due to some technical difficulties and issues, I'm incredibly apologetic, but unfortunately some files were corrupt. Uh, I won't bore you with that. Nonetheless, we re-recorded. Jonah was incredibly generous with his time and I have a fantastic episode for you to listen to. So I really hope you enjoy this episode and I hope you truly are inspired by this incredibly generous and kind individual. So enjoy. Jonah, thank you so much for joining me on Headstrong. I really appreciate it. And this is not your first time on Headstrong, but <laughs> nobody else knows that. Um, yeah, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks so much for having me. Um, and here we are. So it's, the, it's kind of mid-September now. And I think I would like to say lockdown is a thing of the past, although I think maybe Boris has some other ideas. Um, but here we are kind of looking forward, I suppose, as opposed to back. But it has been a bit of an uncertain period in 2020 and you you kind of found yourself sat, sat in London didn't you Jonah? Yeah I, I've spent the last six months in London which uh, it was all right you know I think it was um, a major a major change and shift for everyone I'm sure in a variety of different ways um, but I was uh, working up until until March and and um, obviously the whole world kind of shut down and I've been uh, yeah I've been in London since then and, and trying to keep busy and productive and stay sane basically. Well, in your twenties, you've been you know incredibly busy in the industry as you've built up, built up your your uh, credits and, and all all the work that you take part in. But this was almost a time, I suppose, in your life where you were actually allowed to take a break, you know, without anyone, you know, banging on your door, you know, giving you phone calls, sending you emails. You were probably allowed to take some time of self-reflection and self, you know, you know, not selfish, but, you know, allowed to take some time for yourself. Absolutely. And it was really needed and really healthy, um, I think, you know, it's some, it's something that I always think about uh, actors in particular, but I'm sure lots of other professions too. But I think uh, actors often see their work as, as a massive part of their identity and I can understand it and it makes sense. But I think what was really helpful about this time was just having that completely um, taken away from you and kind of sort of getting back in touch with other sides of yourself, other sides of your personality and um other things that you were that you care about and not having that be the sole focus uh so it took a couple of weeks to really adjust I was sort of wired um for the first few days trying to think of ways that I could be productive and 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 do things but actually after a while um it was really nice just to switch off and not put too much pressure on myself to 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 do things and and just you know re read all the books that I haven't read for ages and, and catch up on lots of tv and uh, I was very fortunate in, in that sense. Oh, spending time reading and just watching stuff like that. It's very wholesome as well. Very good for the mind. Good to, you know, keep keep the creative juices flowing as well by by uh, watching and reading, reading all that content. But you're well known in the um, in the acting world now um, with some great credits uh, in film, TV and theatre from uh, Howard's End, World on Fire. Uh, of course, what's coming up, which we'll talk about a little later on with The Little Mermaid. Um, but before we come on to your career, let's just look at... Um, you know, growing up, I'm fortunate to have known you for 10 years now. 
since probably 2010. Mm -hmm. um, you were in my brother's year at school and you're in the year above me. Um, how do you reflect on that time growing up uh, at school and how do you think that school shaped you? It's an interesting question. Um, I think, I suppose what I would reflect on is, is the fact that I haven't really wanted to be an actor from a very early age. Um, I have lots of colleagues and friends who that was always the, the agenda and always the, the dream. And it was through school that I actually really found that. Uh, and I'm incredibly grateful for that. Um, you know, school and education is about a lot of stuff other than exams and getting grades. And um, I was very fortunate to to go somewhere which uh, invested a lot of time and, and put a lot of value into people. Um, I suppose chasing other af after other interests and and getting to know themselves a bit better and um, being allowed the the time and the space to. Uh, I guess practice whatever it was that you were interested in and passionate about. And um, so, yeah, so I, I'm really grateful for that time. I think something that you and I probably share in terms of values is um, when we were at school, we probably found the drama department and the word that might come to mind for you and me is the word community. I think it was a place for uh, groups of people to, to gather and, and kind of share their, the same love of, of theatre and drama, but also just to be around people with um, kind of a similar almost approach to life. And everyone is, everyone's an equal in a, in a cast, um, but particularly in that drama community, would you agree? Completely. And that was really where I started to uh, enjoy my time at school was when I found that, that theatre community, as you, as you called it, because it was, it was just that it was the, the actors who were involved, the the teachers, a lot of them were English teachers as well. Um, I guess I started to find a bit of an identity and a, and a home with them. And it was how, it was really how I got into acting. Um, I I suppose I'd, I'd liked acting growing up, but it had never felt like it was at the forefront of my mind. And to be honest, even when I started getting into it more, it wasn't so much the acting aspect that came later. It was more um being part of something being part of a, a group that all had like a shared goal and a shared vision for something and that was what initially hooked me um i did a play which we took up to the edinburgh fringe called flames over new jersey and that was a real turning point for me because uh it was the first time i really experienced what it meant to be part of a company and uh, all working for each other and it just felt like a really exciting and felt very attracted to it and uh that was very much the foundation for for everything else and all, all my other acting going forward i think i have to say that was one of my one of my favorite productions particularly i was in edinburgh at the same time as you but that was that was a great show it was had a bit of jazz a live jazz Thanks, band man. in the show and everything that was brilliant it was brilliant um just before we transition over from from your your theater um, introduction to the professional world. Your your mum is a theatre producer, I believe. She used to be. So she came over, uh, she came to England when she was a little younger than me and she wanted to be an actress and uh, very quickly discovered what a frightening and unpredictable career choice that was. And uh, she didn't have the benefit like I did of, of having a, a family there to support you and I guess that kind of acted as a safety net for me and she wasn't she didn't have that so um she made the decision to go into production which was not exactly without its its difficulties as well it's still also quite a precarious industry but um she started producing and uh making documentaries and then I think a little later she transitioned into into theatre making and um that was I suppose before I was born and in my early years, but but really through most of the last, certainly through my adult life in the last 10 or 15 years, um, she changed up and she she now practices as a psychotherapist. I'm, cu I'm curious, as uh, a, a kid, maybe from the early formative years, but up to kind of 16, 17, did you have a lot of exposure to theatre? Did you frequent the theatre a lot yourself? I know that at school we were lucky enough to go and watch productions, but I didn't know if, 
you maybe went with your family or, or friends? Yeah, definitely. And that was something that uh, I I suppose I owe a lot to it because it, it exposed me to, um, I guess, the magic of theatre and, and the importance of theatre as well, not just as entertainment, but as a as a political thing and as an artistic thing. Um, my mum uh, was really passionate about taking me and my sisters to, to see shows from an early age. And so uh, yeah, it was a big, it was a big part of my childhood and, and, you know, I'm very, very fortunate for that. How, how has the kind of theatre, obviously your, your career started in theatre, how's that kind of impacted your approach to your life? Because you mentioned uh, earlier kind of the aspect of a cast and how Flames Over New Jersey kind of helped your, I don't know, mental approach in, in some way, but would you say that maybe the, mm-hmm. the theatre and what a company stands for kind of, has helped you utilize those kind of skills in your own life? Yeah, absolutely. In my own life and also just in my career moving forward, I think it's it's really it's great starting in theatre because it gives you uh, a grounding and a value system about how you want to both be in the world as a, as a professional, but also in general. I think theatre inherently is about um, shared equal experience. It's about, it's not about hierarchy. It's not about putting people on pedestals. It's about working together and having a shared um, shared ambition and shared goal. And that's a really, I guess it's kind of a beautiful thing and something that I've tried to take forward in general. Um, and as I've moved on to do more film and TV stuff, it's something that I really try and hold on to. Um, because when you're part of a theatre company, it's, uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a family and it's a genuinely uh egalitarian place and um yeah that that felt that felt like how the world should be really (laughs) yeah sure prior to that exposure with flames uh that that show from edinburgh i have to say at school as well you you had a passion for for music and singing was that ever a career option for you because i know that you were in a band at school and and you did did some gigs and stuff um was that ever an option it sounds like creatively that was always a that was the way forward for you creatively yeah I think it was from from the age of about 14 or 15 I was playing in a band and at the time it felt like my whole universe that that was what I wanted to do it felt like that's where I was headed and we we were gigging around North London for two or three years and we did all right I mean I think we probably looked back at it through rose-tinted glasses a bit um because it was such a joyous and exciting time for us. Um, but definitely, you know, looking back, I think if you'd asked me at the time, I would have said that that's that's absolutely what I want to do. Uh, in the end, it's not really the way it played out. You know, we, we came about 18 years old, 19 years old, and we all started doing different things. I started acting more. Someone was going to art school. Someone was moving to Montreal. He still plays in a band. Um, he's oh. the last remaining musician. Um but it was, uh, yeah, it's definitely something I was always interested in. And I suppose since then have been trying to find ways of including music in my life, in my professional life as well, whether that be through writing or singing. Um, I usually try and muscle in a little bit on any project I do in, in some musical sense. So oh, really? I did an indie film a couple of years ago and... And I basically begged the director to let me write the titles track, which eventually he let me do. Um, Because it's a massive, yeah, it's something I'm really passionate about. Amazing. Which which project was that? It was a a film called Postcards from London. And it was a BFI film. um, And uh, yeah, I, I basically brought my guitar every day to set in a really unsubtle way of hinting to the director that that's what I like doing. And say, and uh, and he would sort of walk into my trailer and go, "Oh, sorry, don't mind me. I'm just uh, having a bit of a sing and a play." He's like, "Oh, you play?" <laughs> um, I, I was like, "You know, I thought you'd never ask." Um, so yeah, very much engineered that. But it was, I was happy that I did, and I loved it. We we recorded for a couple of days, and and uh, yeah, it's something that I'm, as we speak, trying to get off the ground. I think. Are we going to see you in another band soon, or does the do you not have the time for that? I don't know. I don't know. I think <laughs> at this stage, my um, <laughs> I think at this stage, 
I'm more interested in in the writing aspect. Oh, um, okay. Ironically, for for an actor, I I'm not sure how comfortable I would be on stage singing. I think I realised, you know, I suppose as an actor, you you can hide behind your part a little bit. It's it's less exposing, whereas it's kind of an amazing thing to watch a musician on stage because even though they might have, you know, of course they have their personas and their performance and stuff, but it's kind of just them. And that almost feels quite frightening to me now. I was I was young and naive at 15. That didn't bother me then. But I think it would now. The, the, the naivety allowed you to express yourself. Exactly, exactly. With my skinny jeans and my plimsolls and my... <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting you mentioned um, that you're interested in the writing part there. I, I just want to explore that a little bit. Um, where... What, what interesting where do you write from what do you write from personal experience is it from the heart is it from literally walk going down to the shops i don't know i mean people um have a variety of of ways to approach um songwriting something that i'm just woeful at and i won't even bother attempting <laughs> but um do you pick up the instrument first and just jam and then see what happens or do you kind of detail write some detailed lyrics about some personal experiences i'm just curious yeah, I think um, I've always been really impressed by people who are able to articulate through song how they're feeling either emotionally or something that's happened to them. It's a real skill. Uh, I think I've, I'm not so good at that. I think partly because I uh, I'm not sure I'm any good and I sort of embarrass myself. Um, I cringe myself out. <laughs> so I think what I'm more um, what I find easier is writing writing music for a specific occasion or writing it, for example, in the context of, I don't know, a musical or writing it for someone else. Um, I have been, I won't say too much about it because it's, it's fledgling. But I've been, tr- I've been starting to write a, a musical and I've found that a lot easier because I suppose you're writing from the place of that character as opposed from your own personal experience. And so it's, I find that quite liberating. That is incredibly exciting. Before I ask you what that musical is about, it's really nice and refreshing to hear that whilst you may write for other people, it sounds like you, you enjoy doing it. It's probably quite, um, it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's quite fulfilling to, to do so. And it's probably calming for one's mentality as well to write, write music, take yourself out of whatever you're doing in that day yeah. or week. Definitely. And I've, I've found that the, the pace and the rhythm of that process, a bit like when you're writing like any kind of writing, whether you're writing a song or writing a script, um, I really love it. And I'm really, really drawn to it because it's it's such a different pace to what it's like to, I don't know, make a film or, or put on a show. It's a much more, arguably a much more lonely experience, but it's also a very personal experience and it's much more autonomous. And I find that one of the wonderful things about acting is that it's pure collaboration, whether that's film or theatre. And there's something quite freeing and, and just different about about writing, as I say, whether that's a song or, or a play or a, a, a screenplay, um, because it's yours and you have control over it and it's just a different creative rhythm. So I'm definitely, you know, I'm looking to explore all avenues. Amazing. And so the question is, what is the musical about? <laughs> if you're, if you dare, um, if you dare say anything, maybe a genre, maybe, maybe keep that to yourself. Maybe that was far too personal of me. It's, um, it's a World War II musical. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, set, set in a, uh, set in a prison camp. I'll say yeah. that much. <laughs> okay. Well, we will keep our eyes on Broadway. <laughs> thanks um so let's 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 continue that about the theater then um you you um your relationship with your agent started um following some shows in london with uh flames over new jersey am i correct yes that's correct but then you still also attended cambridge university um with your degree theology how important was it and potentially for your family as well to still achieve that degree at that phenomenal university whilst also balancing your passion and adoration for acting? I don't know, really. I, I think um, my family weren't particularly 
uh, pushy or or married to that idea. I think of anyone, my dad maybe was was the most. He had he hasn't been to university, and I think uh, uh, I I don't know. I think he just thought that I would get a lot out of it, and then I'd really enjoy it. So he was pretty keen for me to go. Um, I I absolutely loved my time there partly because of um you know the educational aspect was amazing and and met my lifelong friends there but i think there was something interesting about going knowing that you what you wanted to do at the end of it um i.e be, be an actor i i found it helpful because one of the things that maybe i've, I've picked up um over the last few years is is how a lot of the most a lot of the actors that i admire the most are some of the most um, like well-rounded people and have had mm. lots of different life experiences and have been surrounded by lots of different kinds of people, i.e. not just actors. And that was really positive for me. I, I found it really fulfilling and I guess enriching as a person to be uh, surrounded by people who were passionate about different stuff and were studying different things and people who wanted to be doctors and writers and teachers um and detectives and kind of you name it it was just a really exciting thing to be around um and something that I yeah I, I'm in the end was incredibly happy that I went I think um when I left school there was a huge question in my mind about whether or not I would apply to university and uh not that it's the be all or end all or a kind of uh you know a prerequisite for doing well but it, it, for me at least it, I, I I'm really grateful for the time there because I think it was yeah it, it was a wonderful experience absolutely and just um out of curiosity who are those uh, actors or creators that you do look up to potentially for inspiration um from whether that be creative work or indeed the the way that they they approach life who are those those people well that yeah that's a really good distinction because I just as I was saying that as well I was thinking in my head that it's funny a, a lot of the actors who I admired the most are of course they're they're brilliant actors but they're also like ones that I've worked with who I really admire the way that they are in the world and the way that mm -hmm. they go about their work and about their lives and sometimes often you know they're all brilliant actors but sometimes it's their it's their uh I guess their attitude and their their way of treating others that I feel really drawn to. And I worked with Leslie Manville recently, who is just so inspiring. Like she's such an incredible actor, but such an amazing person as well. Um, and just absolutely adore her. Same with Matthew McFadden. Again, like brilliant, brilliant actor, but a really genuinely kind man who's hilarious and is interested in everyone else. And those are the, the actors I think that, that stick out for me quite often it's i like it's the people who are very selfless and you talk to them and, and actually they show an, a real engagement and interest in you sometimes i know i know that when we recorded the first episode um we talked how sometimes people <laughs> actually can get um absorbed into the creative world of of um, um film and, and tv and you can really just define yourself by your work whereas actually a lot of people um who we probably mutually respect even more so are ones that are, are able to live their lives with um, passions outside of, of their job. Yeah, absolutely. And I've, I've always felt like that was so key to anyone who's starting out. Um, I think acting can be so all consuming and people can be so loving and dedicated towards it. And that's amazing. And you need that ambition and drive and, and passion for it and passion for the work. But I think people can get a little bit, um, I suppose, or just all consumed. Yeah. And, and so totally focused on, on that and that, that particular career that they, they never sort of, have a stop and a thing kind of look around and and like experience other things um whether that's like creative stuff or not whether that's you know writing or music making or just like can be random hobbies or just really caring about and having really like active um like social lives and and relationships with your family i just think that stuff is so it's so integral um and again i think just makes you a more interesting actor because it, it, it 
it gives you life experiences and and you know i think that that's that's what generally people draw on when they're trying to act like they're, they're drawing on on the experience that they've had and using it empathetically and um so yeah so as as much as you can not be too narrow or single-minded about what you're doing i think is is very positive most definitely you have partaken in a number of genres on both screen and stage now is there a particular dream role that comes to mind for you uh, that you'd like to play one day or does jonah take each role as it comes and actually um you know you know any any role for an actor i suppose is a dream because they're working um <laughs> <laughs> yeah there is that there is that i think it, it takes a very long time and i'm still not there to ever get rid of the anxiety of when the next job is coming in and so you know, it sometimes asked what the dream role would be. And actually, my, my dream is just to, to keep working and uh, keep having opportunities. That's that's basically as much as I can ask for. Um, but I, I suppose, yeah, but even then, like, I just I don't think that there is a specific role. I just think, yeah, the, the, again, the actors that I really admire are the ones who have a real variety and diversity to their careers either through different mediums or different types of characters um, mm. doing, making indie films, making big series, doing plays to 50 people, um, playing villains, playing leading men, doing more character roles. There, you know, there are very few actors actually out there who are able to straddle all of those different things. And, um, you know, there's people like, actually people like Matthew McFallion, people like Andrew Scott, um, mm. I have a close friend of mine, Josh O'Connor, who I am a big, just a huge admirer of and, and admire of his work and his choices. And those are the ones who um, I look up to and try and emulate. You mentioned there briefly that, you know, you have from time to time um, experienced anxiety. And I have no doubt that I can guess when it's come. It's when, um, you know, during or, or any any form of audition process, when it might get a bit quiet from your agent or indeed um, maybe at the start of your career. And I know that anyone starting in the industry will be curious to hear what you have to say. But when you start in your career and, uh, for, you know, rejection is, um, ra you know, quite quite there's quite a lot of rejection at the start of one's career how, how did you deal with that anxiety and were there any specific techniques that you kind of practiced to to help you cope with this or was it a matter of surrounding yourself with the right people um what, what were your what was your approach I suppose it depends on the type of anxiety uh I think I think the thing that we're all starting to talk about and starting to learn is that anxiety can be really rational and understandable and sometimes it isn't um and it's probably the latter that's that's harder to know how to deal with and harder to know how to cope with um i think when it comes to really ostensible objective worries about what's going on i.e you haven't heard from your agent or you haven't got a job in a while um I, th I think that the best way of dealing with it is, is is somewhat cliched, but it's just knowing that it's so common and it happens to everyone and whoever your favourite actor is has experienced that tenfold. And so you're not alone in that experience. And, and it's important to remember that no matter how people are projecting themselves out into the world or how it might seem that they're doing, inevitably they, they have their own anxieties and fears. And so I think feeling lonely with anxiety is one of the main things that I think we can quite quickly um, get rid of well, as you know the more we talk about it uh, but I think in, in terms of the anxieties which feel less understandable or less rational at times I think just finding things again that you feel really safe and comfortable in things that ground you whether that be meditation or um, or family or just having really like strong connections with either people or a certain practice whether that be you know i've been playing a lot of tennis over lockdown and i find that <laughs> weirdly calming um just whatever it might be that sort of relaxes your mind and and gives you a little bit of uh of of kind of calm focus is um you just have to over the over the months and years find out what works for you that is all for part one if you're enjoying the conversation, please do hit subscribe on Headstrong because season four is in the works. And by all means, go click on part two to carry on listening to Jonah and I talking about 
his life and experience. Welcome back to Headstrong. You are listening to part two with Jonah Howard King. I suppose it's important to note that Jonah Howard King is currently not unemployed and his agent has been doing a marvellous job because of the job that you had started before, uh, the job you had started before uh, lockdown and one that will commence soon. And that is, of course, the role of Prince Eric in The Little Mermaid, which, of course, many, many congratulations with I haven't probably properly spoken to you about it apart from the first recording of the podcast. thanks man. um and no it's incredibly <laughs> exciting for you it's a great um probably the the best career opportunity ever and how did it make you feel on that day when you got that call it was it was it was really surreal it, it came at, at the end of such a long period of time of um meetings and auditions and self tapes it was definitely the most most like drawn out audition experience I've ever had. It, it happened over the course of about six months. And uh, wow. it starts, it starts sort of like any other you're, you're asked to, you're, you're sent some, a few, few pages of the script and you're asked to put yourself on, onto a self tape, which people that don't know is basically a home audition. And I mean, nine times out of 10, I mean, that's actually really generous. I'd say 49 <laughs> times out of 50, um, you hear nothing, especially on these big films. Um, it's one of those things where everyone's kind of asked to, to, to read and you don't hear anything for a few weeks. And then I, in this instance, I got, um, I got a call saying that they were, that they liked it and that they wanted me to tape it again from home um, with some notes and it just went from there and eventually I went in and I met everyone and had a period of, of going back and forth maybe four or five times. And in the end, you know, it, it was strange, you know, audition processes are really anxiety inducing and quite frightening, but because it went on for so long, the, the end goal sort of was taken out of sight. And this was partly helped by the fact that the director kept saying, see these auditions as workshops don't don't think about the future just enjoy playing the role um enjoy working with with me this and he is an incredible director uh rob marshall um and i think that was actually a really good lesson in general for auditions of not as much as you can it, it is easier said than done but as much as you can seeing them as a as a chance to to act because you know i guess you can learn a soliloquy and do it in your room but basically to act you need you need collaborators and you need an audience and so that can be hard to come by so auditions I think really are just about um having fun preparing a role and um doing your best and I approached it I approached this process in exactly that way uh and, and by the end you know it was it was thrilling it was it was sweet how they told me I I'd gone oh, in pray for tell. what I was told was, well, I went, I was told that I had been in for the last time, but I'd actually been told that three, like three times already. So I was still slightly suspecting that I might go back in and I was in, in bed and I got, an, uh, it's quite early in the morning. I got a phone call on an unknown number and I don't know, I wouldn't usually have taken it, but for some reason I did. And I, all I heard was this voice at the end of the line saying, um, hello, this is, rob marshall i'm looking for prince eric um, oh. and, uh, kind of thought i mean for a split second was like oh brilliant this is one of my mates he's he's uh, you know <laughs> it's a good joke quite early for, for a joke seven o'clock in the morning but sure um and uh i couldn't really believe it and it was really it was yeah it was it was amazing and, and exciting um and then yeah you have about 24 hours of just being on cloud nine and then you're back down to earth really quickly when you realize that you actually have to do the job and not be crap and you go through all of the typical self-doubt stuff of oh my god all I was thinking about was actually getting the job and now I've got it I need to do it and not be terrible um <laughs> but that <laughs> I think people have that at any job they do um oh no doubt so yeah 
I mean, it's a, it's going to be a, and I know that you already did do some rehearsals before lockdown, and it's a, it's an enormous production. I mean, you're working with uh, with Disney, but um, you mentioned before that it was, you know, quite an enjoyable first day as well. With um, well, you 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 say what happened on the first day? I thought that was a really nice experience. Yeah, well, it was great. I mean, um, we had a we had a lunch that was hosted by by our director and our producers which was for everyone in the cast. Obviously, a big, big film like that has a lot of cast members, a lot of cast members who will probably end up doing just a day's filming and have a line or maybe don't even have a line. Um, and I mentioned before, filmmaking, I'm learning, can be quite a hierarchical business, much more so than theatre. And it's something that I think the industry has to look at and get better at, really. Um but something that was wonderful about this was that absolutely everyone in the cast was invited and we all sat down together and got to know each other and everyone was included and everyone was part of it. And that just felt really special. I mean, it probably shouldn't have felt as special as it did. It shouldn't be so unique, but it is. Um, and it just set a really beautiful tone for, for, the, for the next few weeks and months of feeling like, you know, whatever your role in, in that production be it in cast, in crew, whatever it might be, however big or small, you are like a really valued and respected and needed member of that of that company. And uh, yeah, that just it just felt brilliant to be part of. And it just and you're, it sounds like your your director is rooted in theatre and he's got that sense of community and cast and equality amongst the the cast and of course the crew as well. I mean, without without your crew, without any member of the crew, there's no there's no film. Everything falls away, I suppose. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Rob, Rob, the director, he he has a background in theatre and and dance choreography, so he knows what that means and he knows that the set, sets run best when when there's a good atmosphere and when people feel valued and and happy to be there um so uh yeah yeah it's uh i i have to say i, I feel really 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 proud and, and really happy to be part of it are we are you allowed to say what the uh the next steps are in terms of the timeline or shall i skip over that <laughs> um i'm happy to skip we it are, if you we're back soon <laughs> we're back we're back soon we're back soon it's, it's been a long way uh we've all been dying to go back um but it's it is imminent that is immensely exciting, and we will all be keeping our eyes on the silver screen for JHK <laughs> and his performance as Prince Eric, which is incredibly exciting. Um, Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So just just looking at how uh, humble and kind you you are, Jonah. You know that's come from your upbringing and how you've kind of lived and how you've spent your experiences in life. And it's important to note that you're also incredibly generous with your time and energy because you've you've noticed the disadvantages that certain people have getting into the creative industries i was just wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about your experiences with that maybe how you got into being involved in um the whack arts program and and kind of what the program is oh, about yeah. and, and what you do for it yeah i mean my my involvement with whack arts is just to be a helping hand really i can't take too much credit um but I've, it was a relationship that started a few years ago now and something that I feel really passionate about. It, it's an it's a organisation and a school that basically gives kids who... It gives kids access to, um, to arts facilities and education who, who might not have otherwise got it. And it's something that, um, you know, of the many things that this industry needs to do a bit of soul searching on it's it's right up there and, and making sure that this is an industry that's accessible for for everyone i think um you know I, the, the most interesting stories are, are going to be ones that involve involve all different types of people all different types of backgrounds and that's from top to bottom from producer level writer level um it's uh it's it's not really good enough at the moment at all and unfortunately the the most significant way of of rectifying that is at grassroots level and, and and that kind of comes from from the government and from making sure that uh you know there's enough there's enough funding and there's enough arts arts grants and and as we all know that's been cut over the last few years and it's it's very very unfortunate because we have such a special industry but there are um a it won't survive and b it's not as 
I don't think it's not it's not as fully realized as it could be if it was more inclusive and more accessible so yeah it's it's something that I feel passionate about I think it's something that most people of our generation in the industry is aware of and feels um connected to and engaged with so that that's a positive anyway I mean people are talking about it and and that's the start there are a number of places in this industry that require change and of course grassroots level and 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 the involvement and inclusivity of the the industry is fundamental but we can also look at um the fact that it's a male dominated environment and of course in recent years we've seen the, the me too movement which has of course been a great start but far from far from seeing the end of that movement or indeed uh, progress in the industry but how do you feel as um a white male in the industry and also i didn't know if you could maybe comment on on the the, the imbalance well there's a lot of imbalance in our society and that's reflected in our industry um you mentioned the Me Too movement, uh, which was brilliant and got the conversation going. Um, it's really important not to rest on our laurels, though, because I think, to be frank, there are plenty of, of things that we're seeing either not change or slide back to old old patterns. And, um, yeah, I think, you know, when I think about it, I, I try to think about how I can personally bring about change or how I can at least be involved whether that's to do with um, me too and equal pay and better representation for women but also um, in the context of of something like BLM and, and making sure that people from all like BAME um, groups are all being represented across our screens and behind the camera as well and so I think the the, the main takeaway from it for me is is that uh, a privileged person like myself, privileged because of the color of my skin and my gender, my sexuality, and all of those things. You know, we need to be outspoken and proactive, and we need to be massive parts of the conversation. Uh, we also need to balance that with knowing when to take a step back. You know, people people like me have been given a platform and an audience for a really long time. And so I think it's it's our turn to to sit down and and, and listen and learn um, and knowing when to be outspoken and because uh, you know and it's it's a it's a fine it's a very fine line but yeah you you've, you've got to be part of the conversation you've got to be part of the change and not be silent because you know to be silent is is to be complicit but also being very very mindful of the fact that these are issues that are affecting not you and to be really harsh about it they're actually issues that are benefiting you so it takes a lot of of self-reflection and a lot of checking oneself to remember that and to uh be i guess alive and, and aware to it um so yeah it's a you know it's it's a complicated thing and it's not it, these changes are not the kinds of things that are going to happen overnight but again absolutely the fact that we're having this conversation is a great start and um you know, I'm I'm excited to see where it's all going to go. I mean, I couldn't have articulated it much better. So eloquently put, sir, of course. Um, but no, absolutely. The self-reflection <laughs> is uh, fundamental um, in any approach to not any movement or anything, but just in, in terms of uh, any approach to our, our current climate and society. I think it's fundamentally important to see what you can do as an individual before you take it any bigger than that. Absolutely. So... In this um, industry, we know that there are trials and tribulations. We've talked about the 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 woes and troubles of auditions, and of course, the you know elation of achieving uh, an audition and pulling off something like like Prince Eric, for example. Um, is there something looking back? You know, I'm sure that any, any aspiring actor might be interested to hear this. You know, the, uh, getting over failure. Is there something that helps you to get over that challenge or failure? And if there was any specific example. Um, from your career to date? I think the best piece of advice I could give is probably to try and um, is try and rethink it, not so much as, as failure, but j just as learning experiences and to not take things too personally. I think when I was starting out, I was doing, I mean, I was lucky enough to be doing lots of auditions. I mean, that even that you can't take for granted. Um, but I was doing these auditions and having no feedback and no recalls and certainly no jobs. 
And I think it was very easy to make it about me and make it about something that I had done wrong or that I had failed at. Uh, when actually it's not really, it's just, it's really not like that. And people always said that to me when I was starting and I, I really took it with a pinch of salt and didn't genu- didn't really believe them because I thought, well, okay, that's very nice of you to say that it's not about me, but let's be honest, if I was good enough, I would have got it. But because acting is such a subjective thing and casting is such a subjective thing, the thing that I've learned partly through my own experience and partly speak to friends or directors and casting directors is that so often they have such a specific idea of who they want in their head and if you're not right for it then you're not right for it and that doesn't mean you're a bad actor in fact you might be an even better actor than the person that they ultimately cast Um, but it really is true that you can make and leave these impressions on directors and casting directors and it will come back um, to your to your benefit and that not not thinking that every time you get a no or a rejection is a massive failure like it's it's just it's just part of it 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 really is part of the journey um however cliched that sounds but it would be (laughs) it would be weird if you got your first massive job um and actually probably not that helpful further down the line um of course acting is like it's such a career it's a career that has such an ebb and a flow to it and it's very easy to make comparisons to yourself uh, between yourself and others and that's the other thing I would say about it just that again it, it's such a comparative industry and it's so easy to think oh well this person's doing that and that person's doing you know doing this job um, but if you can kind of just stay on your own path and just stay um, you know a little bit circumspect and 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 think you know this is a it's a it's a marathon not a sprint and all of that stuff um because it's true so uh yeah i would i would try whenever possible when something thinks feels like a failure in this industry it, it probably isn't and wherever possible try and reevaluate it and think of it as a as a as a learning experience whilst you may may not have um specific goals set out for you and as you've just said there you know every path in this industry is completely um individual and 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 every opinion is subjective but do you have um a career goal what and is there an end goal or is it to constantly achieve and be a better individual both professionally and as uh, an individual in society wow i mean (laughs) i think like i i think my ultimate goal in my career would be probably just to to have that is to have a career that um (laughs) meant that I didn't have to do another job and that supported me through my life I have other aspirations I would love to direct I'd love to produce stuff um and I think wherever possible I would love to make work uh and use any platform that I might have to try and raise up others and you know and raise up people who might have not had, had the same um opportunities that I did at an early age so I think you know there are there are people out there in the industry who are just a real positive um figures who are all about like I don't know just just raising others up and and um thinking about the the community of our industry as opposed to just the individual and I would yeah I would love to be able to do that Absolutely. Just before I ask my final question um, on the podcast and the final question of indeed the series, um, what, I, I re-listened to our first recording of the podcast. I can still hear just a couple of bits and there's just one bit that I couldn't resist yeah. that just I feel that needs to be out in the world. And it, I, Jonah and I were talking about school and a production that he was doing at school. And it was indeed uh, the Scottish play Macbeth and Jonah was playing the title role. And I remember when we were recording this, it occurred to me that I had this question, this burning desire to ask Jonah a question <laughs> that I hadn't asked for seven years. And it was, um, Jonah w- was um, performing, uh, I, I don't know, I can't remember which which speech, but uh, a specific monologue on, on stage and was blindfolded was the, uh, and subsequently witches, fell off. I think. Yeah. <laughs> indeed jonah fell off the stage yeah. and i and i i had to ask jonah whether it was on purpose or not and it had been seven years alas apparently it was not 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. It was it was um it was at the beginning of the fourth act, I think. It was that the famous scene with the Hubble Bubble Toil and Trouble stuff. And uh someone had the bright idea to blindfold me. Um actually that was our director. She's she's amazing. <laughs> um <laughs> def- definitely wasn't her fault. It was um but I was completely <laughs> blindfolded and uh I the the choreography is this of the scene was was that the witches would <laughs> spin me round at, at greater and greater speeds and um during the rehearsal process it started as like a very mild slow pace and i think the nerves of opening night took us to a whole another accelerated state i mean i was going at 30 miles an hour on the stage <laughs> round and round um, <laughs> and uh yeah I, I i just fell straight off the stage basically um the witches left and i thought i was in one part of it and i just clearly wasn't so i fell off and um took my blindfold off in genuine fear and surprise and i mean in a way it's not to sound too cheesy it's kind of the magic of theater that if you just get on with it and pretend like that was meant to happen people kind of buy it um you know it's it's sort of a good a good lesson i learned i guess uh and because I spoke, I said afterwards, I think it was to my mum or some someone who had seen the show afterwards. And I was like, oh, my God, it was so bad. And then I fell off the stage. It was a nightmare. And they were like, what do you mean? I thought that was that was like a that was part of it. And they had no idea, which was, a good, yeah, a good lesson. But amazed and kind of very flattered, actually, that anyone would have thought I'd had the balls to do that on purpose. <laughs> so shout out to anyone that thought I did. But. Uh, no, it was it was definitely definitely an accident. <laughs> I love it. I mean, I'm so pleased that I finally put that to bed. But I know it's brilliant. I love it. Um, Jonah, thank you so much for joining me. My final question on the podcast, which I do ask every single guest, and yes. of course, I need I need to hear what you have to say. What does the word headstrong mean to you? Headstrong is, uh, I guess. You know, I think people think of it as as being uncompromising and having strong convictions, and maybe it does up to a point. But for me, the people who I think of being headstrong are, well, they are those things, but it's as a result of being both um, aware and unafraid of their fears and their vulnerabilities. And, you know, we hear it a lot nowadays, but it's true. I think there's a real strength in, in vulnerability. Um, and I think people who are headstrong kind of, they, they have a strong sense of self and identity and know who they are. Um, and I think that comes from being, you know, recognizing that you have fears and vulnerabilities and embracing them and not trying to be afraid of them, because if you're not afraid of them, then in a way they, they can't hurt you so much. So, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's, um, strength, strength through vulnerability. Is my well, final certainly answer. <laughs> final answer. Locked it in. If only it was a million pounds. Um, Jonah, thank you so much um, <laughs> for for joining me on Headstrong. I really Thanks, appreciate man. it, and thank you for the second recording. Of course, um, we will no, all no wait worries. in anticipation for your. We'll all wait in anticipation for your exciting role, uh, and of course, anything else that you do uh, in the future. And best of luck with absolutely everything. Um, you're, you know, you're an incredibly kind and generous man, and I think you certainly are headstrong, and you define what you've just you've, you've just said yourself. So, thank you very much. Appreciate that, Louis. Thanks, man. And that is it for season three and this episode, episode six, with Jonah Howard King. I can't thank Jonah enough for being so generous with his time for recording not one but two episodes with me. Uh, I think we can all agree that Jonah is certainly headstrong and he has spent a lot of his life um, being self-reflective and and he's got into a place where we wish him all the best and I have no doubt will be incredibly successful starting with his role as Prince Eric. Thank you to you, the listener, for listening to Headstrong and this series Creatives in Conversation. I hope you've enjoyed it and if you have, please do share it on your social media platforms, tell your family, tell your friends and indeed, please do rate us and give us five stars if you can and indeed leave a review. Every listen, every review truly helps. And if you do subscribe, 
Therefore, you'll be you'll know about season four straight away. You will be the first to know. By all means, check out our social media accounts on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I hope you stay strong, stay healthy, but most importantly, stay headstrong. Thank you so much for listening.